Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Nights of the Pages Library. We're a little podcast dedicated to reviewing audiobooks. I am Bo Knight, and joined, as always, by my brother, Ryan Knight. And today, we actually have an extra special book for you guys. We are looking at Interstellar Gunrunner, a space opera adventure, book one, written by James Wolonic and narrated by our good friend, Garrett Michael Brown. Yeah, and we... You guys will be finding out soon why we say that Garrett Michael Brown is our good friend. Um, we'll, we'll keep that card a little close to the chest right now. But as it stands, you guys will hear this once the book is available. However, we've already listened to this book, and you guys can't even get it yet. So we feel pretty special. Early access. We feel pretty special. Sorry if we gloat just a little bit over that. This is our first, like... Uh, what do I call it? It's like our podcast perk, our first podcast perk. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I mean, it's most of you are like, whatever, man. It's not Dollar Shave Club. So, like, <laughs> but true to, to, to us, it, it feels really special. Just, just so you guys know, we uh, we are humbled by this. It's really awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, and I mean, if you guys want to be like, whatever, bro, it's not whatever the sunglasses one everybody else has the ad everybody runs uh, oh i don't know that one <laughs> feel free to email i get a lot of manscaped yeah manscaped ones you know yeah <laughs> the weird mattress one that i just tap listen to <laughs> good 12 boxes of manscaped in the back bro what do you guys know mm -hmm. about that my no. balls are so smooth we we don't have any of that cool free stuff you know we're not that cool of a podcast but we this is our first like free thing that like means something legitimate to us like it's not just like you know dollar shave club access so so if you guys think that's ridiculous please feel free to email us kotpl.pod at gmail.com uh we're on twitter we're on youtube we're on facebook we're pretty much anywhere you can find a podcast like it's literally easy if you just hit if you just google us then you'll find us somewhere so yeah feel hopefully. free to contact us Oh, I got a new TikTok video I'm going to put out here soon, too. So how's the depression doing? Uh, it, it's pretty bad, but uh, but I'm hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's not actually depressed. Nobody think that. No. I did tell Bo, though, to, if I get really depressed after I start making TikToks to, uh, to check on me every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So let's, uh, what, yeah. let's move on with this one. Uh, yeah. So like we said, uh, Interstellar Gunrunner. This is book one of a three-part series, uh, Space Opera Adventure. And this book is not available on Audible yet. This is where we listened to it, was on Audible. Um, we got a little bit of early access to this, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, this will probably release day and date with the book itself. So uh, you might be able to listen to it when you hear this, hopefully. But as it stands right now, um, the release date and stuff is 2022. But we don't know the exact day this book is released. So, yeah. So, yeah. Hopefully, we can. Yeah, we, it hasn't came out yet, so there is no release date. Right. Uh, so this James, how'd you say it? Wolonek. Wolonek. Is that how you said his name? Wolonek. Wolonek. Yes. Thank you. I, um, I think so. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. Uh, he has. Like just... a, I, I'm pretty sure he's Wolonek. Isn't yeah, that what I said? I, yes, and I think that's exactly how they say it in the uh, in the book itself. Uh, I think, from what it looks like, so this is the first book we've ever listened to of his, and it looks like this series and just a couple other books he's got going on in his repertoire, at least that are available online. Um, oh, he did a book with Rhett C. Bruno as well. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I saw that too. So I think these things, this this book is what this is basically a sci-fi book. Uh, if that wasn't yeah. apparent from the name of it, Interstellar Gunrunner. Uh, and I think these kinds of books is what he leans toward is sci-fi novels and stuff. It, just 
just glancing at his things sci-fi maybe some fantasy stuff thrown in there so yeah i don't think he's writing like any true stories right what do you think about garrett michael brown as the narrator of this one i like him but i i i it is because he he is kind of a new narrator he he told us that and i i think it is a little obvious and it's because it's this this we, we got access to the whole trilogy but we're just talking about the first book his accent has a little bit of a tendency to wander a little bit and he pronounces certain words very very odd in my opinion but i i do think he does very well like especially for the main character in this his name is bodhi Drezik, and i think he he kind of like does a good job of like embodying that character because yeah. the character is like a real like smooth talker and i think he does a very good job with that i yeah i, I, thought... I feel like he kind of misses the mark when when the cast gets a little wider Right, and there is a really wide cast in this book, which we'll talk about here in a minute. I thought well, by, his... by no means did he pull me out of the story because something he, like he's doing a terrible job. I think I think he's he's doing good, but I I think it is a little obvious that he is relatively new. And that's, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's a fair assessment. And again, I like I thought his Bodhi Drezik was great. To be honest, I thought he. Uh, to me, this was his bread and butter of the story, which is good because Bodhi is the main, not only the main character, but the story is told through Bodhi's eyes from first person. Well, it, it's it's written as as like Bodhi's memoir. It's exactly. like Bodhi is writing it. Right. And I thought he embodied that character of Bodhi extremely well. Even if that was yeah. just his normal voice, it fit the character very, very well. Mm-hmm. Um I do tend to agree with you. I think that he was a little bit back and forth on some of his his accents, but again, that could be I don't I don't know what it's like to narrate a book. And a few of the other people that we've had as guests on this podcast are literal veterans of the craft. So, it's not very fair to compare somebody who's been doing this for a little over 2 years and only has 20 books under his belt to some of the other guys that we know personally who have literally have 500 books that are just available online. Who knows if they've done even more than that. So I, I think that Garrett did a very good job for this book, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I think he does well. And I, yeah. And, and I, I think he adds a lot to the humor too. Like this book made me laugh so many times. I actually like, did. I, I laughed a few yeah. times too at this out loud. Like out loud. Which, no, I'm talking like the like to yourself, yeah. like like out or, loud, like laughing. Or where you just blow some air out of your nose. Yeah, where you're like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's chuckle weird. <laughs> no, but that, I mean, this book is pretty funny. It really is. Um, we'll get into the meat of that when we pass the spoiler wall too. So this, like I said, this is def- this is a this is a pretty sci-fi of sci-fi books. So if you're into sci-fi, th- I'll, ha- I'll have to try to save some of these things for after the recommendations and the spoiler wall. But this is, it has a little bit of sci-fi word salad going on. But out of a lot of books I've listened to, this is one of the least offenders of that for how sci-fi it is. Does that make sense? Well, and yeah, it does. But because Bodhi has like these sidebars with you where he's like, right. okay. This is what this means. Yep. And then if, if that comes up again later, he'll kind of remind you about what he said before. He'll be like, okay, remember this part? That's important. Remember that. Yeah. There are And also... I, I really appreciate that because a lot of the time for sci-fi books, I'm like, what are you talking about? The tachyon drive? Like, what the fuck are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. See, and that's when I first started listening to this, that's what I was worried I was about worried. a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that stuff when we pass the spoiler wall. I don't want to get too deep into that right now. Um, how long was this one since it's just the first of the uh, trilogy? I think it's about like eight hours. Uh, I don't think it's too terribly long because the three books total, I think, only total up to about 24 hours, right? For the, the omnibus. Yeah, it's, it's, hang on, well, I have it sped up. It's 30 hours for the for whole three, trilogy. For the three books. Okay, so. Yeah, and I think the second one is the longest one. Okay. 
yeah so this would this puts it in right around eight to ten hours i don't have an exact number because i can't actually pull it up on the audible website so just know about eight to ten hours and as we've said plenty of times before that's actually right in about the sweet spot i think for most people so that i think is good uh yeah, I, I i agree i think it's it's about right I don't have a price available for you guys because, again, can't pull it up on the Audible website. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's get into some of the important questions. Is this one easy to follow? Oh, I think it's super easy to follow. I think it's pretty easy to follow as well for the sole purpose of – I actually found myself – I was in a bit of a rut this – while I was listening to this this week, if I know Bo will understand what that means, but to those of you who don't understand, you're like in a rut with an audiobook. What the fuck are you talking about? So I caught myself, I would turn this one on on a long car ride. And about 15 minutes later, I was like, I got I just gotta listen to something else. I couldn't focus. I my mind was just wandering all over the place. I could not hang on to this one for some reason and i'm not trying to take anything away from the book when i say that i just I was in a weird place so i would turn this off i'd listen to a podcast maybe i turn this one back on again for like 30 minutes come back to it and turn it back off again however by the end of this i still knew what the story pretty much was from beginning to end so i actually think that's a comment to the author because there are a couple parts where Bodhi, who's telling the story, literally is like, okay, let's recap what happened. I know. Yeah. And he tells you, he's like, if you forgotten to this point, X, Y, and Z has happened. And now moving on. And I was like, oh shit, I really needed that. <laughs> I needed that I, to catch me back up. I really appreciate that. And yeah. for me, this book went down like an ice cold glass of water on a 110 degree day. I started nice. listening to it and I finished the whole trilogy in about four days. Nice. Like I, I couldn't turn it off. I would, I really, really liked this. Yeah. And I, I, I know this isn't like the necessarily the recommendations part, but I think this, as far as like easy listening, like if you listen to our last episode about Metro, like this is like the complete opposite of that. And yeah. I think this is like a good palate cleanser for me of like a nice light book after something so heavy and dense and dark. Sure. Yeah, that I think that is also so that that's a good point because the narrator of Metro really lended to that dark, gloomy atmosphere of Metro. Whereas like Garrett on this one he brings that very kind of upbeat narration yeah. in my opinion you know i think his narration fits this book pretty well because this is much more even though there are some pretty there's some pretty dark shit that happens in this book yeah it, it is super dark I and mean, we'll get into it later i was explaining like the god engines to somebody else they're like man that book sounds super depressing i was like no it's actually super light and fun <laughs> yeah it, it is kind of crazy that those two things can go hand in hand and I think that that's, that's a strength from the author as well as from the narration in this one. Yeah. Uh, so if it's not apparent already, this one's pretty easy to listen to. This is actually one, if somebody's like, yeah, I kind of like sci-fi. I like Star Wars. I'd be like, nah, dude, listen to this book. This is a pretty decent like introduction to like sci-fi stuff. Uh, it's not too heavy on the sci-fi word salad, like Bo said the main character is explaining like he'll take you out of the story and explain something to you on the side which is very very nice because i've listened to some sci-fi books like you said about halfway through i'm like i don't i still don't know what this thing is that they're talking about yeah like like you said what is the naratoka engine i don't know what that is yeah or, you can't just make up these words and not explain it to me like what is actually happening because I don't know. I'm not in that universe. This this book does a very good job of – it's like a baby steps sci-fi book. Which yeah. Is, which That's a good way to put it. I think you said it best. This is a good – you go from a super heavy book like Metro to something like this. It's lighthearted. It's well-explained it's it's short it's to the point it's it's a good 
it's it's a good book. I mean, if we hadn't already recommended it, then this is a good time to say that's our, that's my recommendation. I think it's a good book, and I think it's a good book for anybody to be honest. Um, there are a couple of heavy things brought up in the book, but they're told in a pretty lighthearted way, and the way the main character kind of makes light of them makes it like you said the exact opposite of metro where the heavy stuff is like touted on and you hold on to it for a long time to the point where metro had me like pausing it just to take a breather while i was yeah dude in the dark for <laughs> sure it's like it's like oh my god yeah this is this book that's a very good way to put it this is like the exact opposite of that so yeah, and that's not a bad thing. I like this book too. I like the whole series. Like I said, I I, I plowed through it in a couple days. Right. Went down I, super smooth. I would definitely highly recommend this one, especially like if if you're listening to our podcast, and you're like, I like to read, but I like to be able to do other things while I'm reading. Check this one out. I would say sure. like if you've never listened to an audiobook, this is probably a good place to start because it's it would be kind of hard to get lost because they remind you about things that happening. And like I understand that you like if. If you like take your audiobook super seriously, you might find that kind of annoying, but it's done in like such a lighthearted way that I actually found it super charming. Sure. I, I agree 100% with that. Uh, I did not listen to all three. Uh, as Bill said, we do, we have the entire collection of the three books, but I only listened to the first one, so I cannot speak for the next two. But as long as, if they continue on with the same style and storytelling and stuff, I could definitely see that the whole series being great to listen to so I, I mean the second book stuff gets way 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 more complicated than it is in this first one sure. but it, it it keeps that lighthearted tone and i i enjoyed all three books that's good and we will probably visit this one again in the future because we do have all three and we're going to get a special episode out of this uh spoiler alert for anybody else so yeah i will be coming back to this one in the future i'm sure yeah, so yeah, that's two heavy recommendations from us. Are we ready to go past the spoiler wall? Yeah, we'll pass the spoiler wall now. So if you're new here, we, uh, we're just going to go ahead and talk about the whole book. So if you don't want this spoiled for you, please pause this now. Go ahead and go listen to that book and then come back and please hear what we have to say about it. Because the discussions of the podcast, like this is a discussion Bo and I were going to have anyways. We just happened to hit record on the podcast. So if you have something you want to say about this book or anything else, again, you know, please feel free to email us or contact us in any way. We'd like to hear what you have to say. Yeah. And so, yeah, past the spoiler wall. See, I really like the way that this book opens to give us kind of a picture of Bodhi Drezik as a person. So it opens up and there is this conflict between the hegemony, which are essentially like the galactic empire that rules everything, and the rebels. And like Bodhi's getting into this discussion. You might have to remind me of her name. I don't remember her name, but she she essentially doesn't like Bodhi because he's a gun runner and he sells weapons to both sides. And like everybody kind of knows that he's kind of a sleazy scumbag who's only in it for the money. Yeah, which do you remember her out? name? Selendis? No, that's StarCraft. Dude, I'm okay. The one complaint I had about this book while I was listening to it, by the end, I kind of had them lined out. There's about 10 main characters. Is that fair to say? About 10 names that are going to come up yeah. over and over. And I'm not saying they are bad names. Uh, as somebody who kind of writes, you know, D&D stories, I love to hear names. That's something I struggle with when I'm writing is coming up with unique names. This author comes up with great names. However, when every name is unique, I, as the listener, had a little bit of a hard time keeping them straight. Um, is It's not Gadra, because Gadra... No, 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 no. That oh she's my there. gosh. Yeah, dude, I, I, it, I, it doesn't I don't matter. Agree. She's not it's super important in this book. But anyway, she's like telling Bodhi that like they're having this problem with these insurgents and he is not a, he can go down to the planet, but he's not allowed to sell them any weapons. Right. And so he goes down to the planet, obviously, talks to these guys and sells them weapons almost immediately. <laughs> the the rebels. And then we go through how Bodhi is able to be like this this revolutionary gun runner is because he has these two AIs on his ship called Left and Right, and they design weapons for him on the fly 
So they design them one time and then they delete everything so that nobody can be able to replicate the stuff that he's making. And then he also has this super fancy nano machine fabricating system that he does a really good job of explaining what it does. It can break down any matter and, and remake it into something else. And so he, he makes all this stuff on the fly for the rebels. He, he makes a big sale. He does that. And then I, I can't remember her name, but she checks his ship. She weighs it down to like the nanogram to see if he's lost any mass while he was there. Yeah. And then he says, yeah. To sell her weapons to counter the weapons that he sold them. Right. Yeah. He basically, so Bodhi is a classic kind of mercenary gun runner in that he is literally just. All he cares about is making money. He doesn't care which side wins or loses. As long as he can sell some weapons, that's all, that's his whole game. And his character is very funny when he does this stuff too. Yeah, it is pretty funny. But we do we do find out very quickly too that Bodhi is also in a ton of debt. That's one of the earliest things. Yeah. Shortly after he makes these weapons, we find out, his plan is to take out another loan for like three trillion dollars to fund his expeditions to basically pay off his previous debt to then yeah, con he, continue going. He owes like 45 billion, right? What, what are they? I don't even remember what the money's called, it doesn't matter. He owes 45 billion to Narakad the Lesser. Yeah, he's basically your classic American. Who owns? Yeah. Who owes most of their money to the bank? So, <laughs> the only yeah, difference he, is okay. the only difference is that uh, Narakad the Lesser will destroy Bodhi, whereas your bank will just take all your shit away. Yeah, that's very true. So he sets <laughs> up this meeting with a a bunch of other people he could lend money from to give back to Narakad the Lesser, and right? Narakad yeah, the that's Lesser what he, is going to be there. That's what he tries to do, right? He's going to borrow money from all these other people to pay off Narakad the Lesser, right? Yeah. Okay. But then when they have the meeting, Narakad the Lesser says, no, I actually have a job for you, correct? Well, everybody bails on Bodhi. They're like, we're not, we're not paying for shit, Bodhi. We know you're full right. of shit. Yeah. You're, you're, you're a piece of human filth, essentially. Right. And so Narakad the Lesser is like, if you don't pay me right now, I'm going to destroy you cell by cell. And we Nerika the Lesser. I, I don't remember what kind of race they are, but he is he's this race that is they're, essentially um, like a, a collective intelligence. Oh, go ahead. They're Sedrona, right? Is what oh, yeah, called? that's right. They're Sedrona, which so are basically like, are they like? Uh, well, how does he explain it? Like a group of fish eggs come yeah. together. Okay, yeah, and they like the way I picture them is they inhabit a suit that kind of looks like a human, and they all the. The grouping of fish eggs just floats around in like this helmet with a clear face shield, basically. Yeah, so yeah, it like floats around in a suit, so he's like a big suited up. But the the important thing about the Sedrona is that in any if if any of the, the their fish egg substance comes into contact with any other Sedrona fish eggs, they transfer all the information that they have. Right. So, like, even though he's in his own suit, if he were to come into contact with other Sedrona eggs, he would essentially, like, absorb that consciousness. Yeah, and he tells Bodhi, right, that you're going to – to pay off your debt to me, Well, you're going to we, do this we job. We should explain first. He shoots his artist, which he needs to run his god and That's – that's right. Yeah, okay. So they, to, to travel through space super quickly, they have to essentially bargain with these big eldritch beings that don't exist on this plane. But they call it pinching. So like the eldritch Cthulhu? beings will like – Yeah, like Cthulhu, exactly. <laughs> so they'll, they'll, they pull them through space for them. And so his – Bodhi's god engine that he has runs on art. So he has like an artist in his employ, and he has to like paint – new paintings for him to run his god engine which and i Eric did like, to be honest shoots I, him i i only bring that up because right? i just said i do like that as a thing because that's not that like that in itself to me when i was listening to this like the god engine thing is cool but i do like that this author took it from something that could have been just doom and gloom and made it into something that's can be kind of fun or funny. Yeah. Like, yeah. like this God engine, this literal like Cthulhu being just likes to appreciate good 
paintings and drawings. Like how, yeah. that's kind of funny. <laughs> it is kind of funny. I mean, and they do talk about like the the hegemony because because each of the different gods has different speeds, and so they use a god that runs on pain. So I mean, like it, it's a little obvious, right? They're evil, right? They they literally use engines that run on pain. Yeah, and. I just so yeah, Bodhi basically once Nerikot the Lesser kills Bodhi's artist who powers his god engine. Now Bodhi is left with not only does he have this task from Nerikot the Lesser to uh retrieve something from him, right? He doesn't tell him what it is yet. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't know for a long time. Right. But he also now doesn't have any way to basically travel at essentially light speed on his ship so now he has a couple things to deal with so his first his first task is to go find a new artist to power his god engine well he at first he's just looking for a friend because he talks to left and right his his ai consciousnesses and these things want to merge more than anything but if you if you let them merge essentially the singularity will happen because combining two ais to become essentially like omnipotent gods you don't want to do that Right. However, right. So, so in a they little tell him to get a friend. In a in a little side note, in the beginning too, he's like, "You would think that I never let this happen since you're listening to this memoir, but I did, and you'll find out later why." <laughs> it's it's <Yeah>. pretty funny. <laughs> so yeah, I, he he stumbles across Gadra. Yeah, and Gadra uh, basically she because uh, they go to this. I I don't remember the name of the planet, but it's like a really hostile planet, right? the first yeah i mean that's where where he finds her yeah uh so he goes down to this planet and he finds this young child but he goes like 11 he goes to her room right and finds like all of these paintings that are like incredible and apparently she can do these paintings super quick so his his old artist it would take like a week or more to come up with a painting that would get them like a partial jump in space to he finds this young girl who can paint these things super fast and then we find out here shortly that it's going to buy him even more travel time than his old artist yeah so he 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 is like masquerading as he's like from the hegemony though and yeah. they they pretend like they're sending her to like flight school right so he essentially kidnaps her yeah uh, okay let's be honest sometimes like Bodhi is kind of a piece of shit sometimes. Oh, and, he, what and do you mean he sometimes? Has, he's like almost always a piece of shit. Yeah, and he has but he's really no like problem him. with it. Yeah, that's just it. He's he's super charismatic, and it's it, as a listener, it's pretty funny. So yeah, it's hard to hate on him. So yeah, he takes Gadra back on her ship and produces a painting. I don't remember the 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 eldritch being that's in his god engine's name, yeah, but I don't remember. She he she like whips out a painting in ten minutes and he gets like double the miles he would have got from his old I mean light years no yeah it's what, like what is, li- yeah is it light, light years? years it's like thirty he gets like okay so and that's the thing is the the god offers him thirty yeah, they or, or or offers him like twenty five light years and then uh, he actually gets to he actually gets to bargain with the god for more yeah which is he said he never has done before. So yeah, they they bargain. Is is this where Kesh comes on board? Yeah, I, I think remember. so. This is where uh, Nara Kesh comes in. Yeah. So yeah, Kesh is one of Nara the Lesser's like lackeys. She's another Sedrona, and she tells Bodhi that his job is to res- like this. They're they're gonna they're gonna pinch, and they're gonna go to this world, and in a couple days when they get there a flagship from the hegemony is going to get there and they're going to refuel so they're they're going to load up on uh things that feel pain to for their god engine on off this planet and they're only going to be there for like 10 minutes and they have 10 minutes to get on the ship and steal this thing from the ship yeah steal something they don't at this point they don't even know what it is yeah uh uh she knows narakesh knows but bodhi she doesn't let bodhi know what they're supposed to steal so Bodhi's I is it Bodhi's idea or is it Narakesh's when they get there, he basically thinks they're going to try to join with the rebels in order it, to Narakad the Lesser set that up. Oh, okay. 
yeah so the idea then is that he's going to go there and he's going to try to make friends with the the rebels that are in that same location to help him gain access to this hegemony ship basically yeah and and he gets there and the, in, a, in a move that makes no sense to me he explains to his crew that they are on vacation i, I didn't fully understand that either uh yeah i didn't really get this part i yeah so they they think they're on vacation they're and he also explains like it's weird to go to vacation on a planet with really high gravity because you want to go somewhere that's like light and easy to do stuff but this place has like six times the gravity that earth does which i actually thought was a decent detail in this oh it is like, a good detail like if i'm if i'm gonna be honest when i when i listen to sci-fi stuff i don't really like when they they're like we go to this planet and then we go to this planet and then we go to this planet and there's no difference kind of like yeah. in star wars like they end up on all these planets and there's no difference like everybody can just get off the ship and like oh yeah it's like earth it's like no that's probably not how they would all be so I do like when they put these little details in there that like the gravity is higher or the air is thinner or, or those just little details like that. I do appreciate that stuff. So they go down to the planet and they meet with the rebels. And this is where we meet an important character named Chaska, who is the leader of the rebels. And she kind of explains to Bodhi that she already has a plan that they're going to scuttle the ship. So the scuttle, it basically means destroy it. They're gonna they're gonna destroy this rebel flagship because it's it's impossible to get onto the ship in that fueling window and get to where they need to get to in that amount of time. Right, and they want to steal the resources from the ship. Right, the they want to steal right. the fuel. They want to steal wink. the weapons. That's not what they want. Right, exactly. But as far as we are privy to, and as far as Bodhi is privy to, that's what he is told. Uh, and Bodhi also, what, what was her name again? chaska chaska yeah um he also like immediately falls in love with her apparently she's she's like a a picture a very like bulky like barbarian like uh, amazon woman but he immediately thinks she's super attractive yeah he does kind of like fall in love with her and then from there she kind of explains why the hegemony won't just destroy the planet because there's these special creatures on the planet and they go to they go she goes to show Bodhi what they are. Which and, uh but, I was just gonna say Narakesh, she disguises their ship as a slaver ship. Oh, that's to, right. I forgot about to that. To even enter the airspace. <clears throat> which Bodhi then explains to us, the listener, why like why slavery in this universe exists and what it exists based on. And they have this whole like sliding scale of intelligence that it has to be based on. So humans fall above the requirement. So humans cannot technically be slaves to other aliens. Unless races, they're criminals. Unless they're criminals. But then there's like a sliding scale. So these creatures on this planet, he thinks, will fall under this technical intelligence level so they are being used by the hegemony as slaves so that's well, how and, right that's their disguise to gain access to the planet without yeah, immediately it being shot down but like the the pain engines don't want pain from things that are unintelligent so the more intelligent the the creature is like the more miles they're able to get out of the pain right and Quickly, Bodhi realized <clears throat> he sees some of these creatures, and they basically look like giant rabbits crossed with like bears. Is, is how yeah. they kind of explain it, uh, which is pretty cool sounding. But while they are sort of spying on what the hegemony are doing, while the hegemony are capturing some of these creatures, the they, lopers, yeah, the lopers. Thank you, uh, Bodhi and Shaska, I only remember that because of the gun. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, Boda, Bodhi and Chaska are kidnapped, right, by lopers. Yeah. Who proceed to take them back to a city, a loper city. And so Bodhi realizes a few things pretty quickly. One, they have a city. Two, they have a language. And three, they probably fall outside of the requirement for being slaves. So this is like a war crime essentially being done by the hegemony. Yeah, but the hegemony are a bunch of pieces of shit. Right. <laughs> they don't really care. Right, which is why Chaska's 
you know, group of rebels exists because, yeah, the hegemony basically control the entire universe and are doing things like this that are, you know, other people see them as pieces of shit. So, but Bodhi almost immediately realizes, like, oh, these would be a great help in helping us defeat the hegemony on this planet. Right. And so he he arms them and he like gets one to shoot a gun and they kind of figure it out. And he's like, oh, well, okay, we'll use them. And this immediately pisses Chaska off because she's worried about like them infighting and all this stuff. It, it actually is not that important to them, the, even the overarching plot of all the books. No, it doesn't really – she gets really upset about it because she says a couple things that uh, the Lopers will not – basically they don't like – steal weapons from anyone so like even if they were being fought by the hegemony they wouldn't steal the hegemony's weapons and use them they will only accept weapons they are offered and two because they're like rabbits they are set up in like little clans and they fight amongst each other a lot mm -hmm. so chaska basically says by giving them weapons not only are they going to you know kill the shit out of other people they'll kill the shit out of each other too so she's pretty pissed off about this but so Bodhi goes back and tells left and right, like he gives them like specific designs for a gun. It should only be able to shot so be shot so many times before it like it's useless. Yep. And no reload. No reloading. He says basically a thousand rounds and you throw it away. Yeah, and non-explosive, uh, like charges. And he kind of helps them with like a design because the lopers are a little bit different than humans, and so they make like a ton, a ton of guns <laughs> and just start handing them out. But Bodhi does like a little test range to for for like all the other commanders that are down there uh, to show them kind of like, okay, like this is the guns I'm gonna give them. And he shoots it and like immediately realizes like, oh, the the left and right didn't listen to me because it like destroys the target. It blows it up. Yeah, it but explodes, he's like it's too which it's he... too late to go back because we already made a bunch of them. So Yeah. This the only thing that's important about this too is that it puts it in Bodhi's head that left and right did not follow his instructions exactly yeah, so, so it makes him a little nervous sentient right it makes him a little nervous about the way they're acting Wait, which this part to me is kind of weird that he doesn't immediately go back and talk to them he doesn't talk to them about this for a long time no he really it doesn't really come up again until almost the end of the book he so uh, yeah they they arm a bunch of the lopers yeah and then <clears throat> that hegemony ship shows up right and it shows they, up earlier than they expected too right but they proceed to so not only do they have to attack the ship they have to attack like the outpost that the ship is docked at too so they have to basically brute force their way into this outpost as well as onto the ship in order to capture the ship which yeah if i remember right it goes well up until the point that they get on the ship, right? Yeah, and, and like before they even go on the ship, they 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 realize like the Lopers are doing a little too well. Like they're not having as many casualties as they expected. And they like watch some footage and the guns are auto aiming. They aim for the Lopers so they don't miss a single shot. Right, which, which is also had, concerning. Bodhi had said to have it be accurate like so that these creatures didn't have to try too hard to aim but he's noticing like they're literally running with this thing not even aimed where they're firing and it's firing on target anyways well they're like redirecting in the air which i think is yeah. sick <laughs> um and at some point right his is it at this part when his crew gets kidnapped during, they got like, kidnapped PSL? earlier. We we kind of skipped okay. it. They they got kidnapped way earlier. With actually when he was with the Lopers. That's right. Yeah, they go yeah, back and okay. rescue them, and his crew's all pissed off because he basically abandoned them for like two days. Well, they're kind of pissed off until they figure out because he then has to like it's a little bit later, right? But he has to admit to them what's going on, and yeah. then they're all on board. They're like, "Dude, we signed up with a gun runner. Of course, yeah. we want some action." That's true. <laughs> Which I did think was funny. So yeah, they take a bunch of the lopers up to the ship, and yeah, like this is when like shit goes to hell. All and this is when explodes. it's bad. Yeah, yeah, because not only are the lopers armed well, but the hegemony crew is armed really well, and yeah. they start just 
annihilating the lopers and actually quite a bit of Bodhi's crew who helps him board it. But Bodhi is able to make it to this room and he's supposed to collect this canister. It's just a little canister. I imagine like a thermos, essentially. That's kind of what I imagine too. Yeah, just a little tiny cylinder looking object. But he, he gets a hold of it and Chaska like comes up behind him and is like, give that to me, Bodhi. Like, that's what we came here for. And we, we know you know what it is. And he's like, I don't, I don't fucking know what this is. And she knocks him out. And then he like wakes yeah. back up. He wakes back up and like the gravity on the ship is all fucked up. So he's like floating around and he, he's able to locate Chaska again and she's knocked out and he decides to save her and he gets the canister and they, they have a harrowing escape and the, the ship comes and picks them up like at the last minute. But he, he doesn't really, Chaska kind of, she, she takes him hostage again, right? They like don't tie her up well enough, I guess. And she, she takes Bodhi hostage and she like explains that they cannot give this canister to Narakod the Lesser or, or she's like going to lose her, like she's going to like write them off essentially. And I can't, she was, she like wants to leave the ship, but she can't. And, and Bodhi is keeping his, he's not supposed to have these AIs there. I think they're illegal. And so she, too, she, yeah. She, that that's like where his escape pod would be is where the AIs are kept, and Kesh is is trying to kill Chaska, but obviously Bodhi doesn't want that to happen. He's in love with her, so he takes Chaska into the room with the AIs, and it kind of like blows her mind. And then they they hide in there and wait for Kesh to come in. And, and Kesh at this point had been injured, but she she drops the canister into like the the manufacturing unit, and it has this 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 vat that will essentially break down anything but he he messed with it so it wouldn't break down the metal and uh kesh figures it out and she gets in there to go to go grab it but since she'd already been injured there was a hole in her suit that wasn't metal and so she dissolves which is this like that's horrible she just like dissolves in this vat yeah it's really really horrible and yeah and they and they concoct this plan to Make it seem like Kesh took the canister away from them. Like Kesh took the canister away from them and uh, and uh, robbed them essentially, and was gonna like double cross Narakod the Lesser because they don't want to give him the canister. And he shows up on like his sick battle barge that is covered in bodies of all different types of aliens, which I think is super cool. Yeah. Narakod the Lesser is a pretty cool character. He he's actually kind of a cool like overarching bad guy i do i do appreciate a good overarching uh you know actual bad dude in a story uh, but they they actually are able to convince him that kesh took the canister but then he 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 looks at bodhi's like jacket and he has like a little bit of kesh's goo on him still and so she, right. he uses the goo to learn what kesh knew and he's like what did you do with kesh doesn't he have one of the constructs try to mimic her? Like, in yeah, their he, cube? he has in the in the ice boxes. Yeah, yeah, he has one mimic Kesh, and then he has one mimic the artifact. Right, and but Nerika the Lesser kind of figures it out almost immediately. Yeah, he sees right through it, and I just like his line how he's like, "Your constructs are very dumb for being so smart." Yeah, because he asks them like some simple question that only the Sedrona know. He's like, "Where were you born?" and the construct is like we were born on whatever planet that Sedrona come from and he that's when he says it he's like your constructs are very dumb for being so smart because we all know that Sedrona are not born we are merely exist or some shit like that they i think they're propagated is what he says yeah something like that basically they have their own language that somehow Bodhi's constructs did not know about so yeah we kind of have this standoff where the Bodhi says he has like antimatter, which is essentially like a like a, a a nuke that would kill everybody if if it's activated. So if if he dies, it'll automatically activate. And we we so should also mention that Narakesh, while she was on his ship, the reason he basically didn't betray them from the beginning is she has like warheads in like her fingers. Yeah, that if she if something were to happen to her. She can detonate them at any time, basically, and wipe his ship out completely. Yeah. But so, 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 like, the only way to get rid of the antimatter, quote unquote, is to 
is to turn off the constructs, but he can't do that. So what Nerikov the Lesser wants him to do is transfer control of them, even though at this point we, we know that they are like, they're actually sentient. They can do whatever they want. And so what Bodhi does is he lets them out. And I, I thought this part was actually super, super cool and interesting. Yeah. I don't know what you thought. I thought it was pretty interesting because what he does is he says he has to basically release them. And they've been wanting to merge this whole time, like we said from the beginning. And Nerika, the lesser, apparently thinks once they are released, if as long as he says the code word, they will obey him. And I like that little part because Bodhi releases them and Narika the Lesser is like, Bodhi is a, and then time ceases to exist well, or whatever yeah, it he is. Because tells, he tells him the command word is Bodhi, like the command phrase is Bodhi is the best. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> Bodhi is the best. Yeah. <laughs> Which just, I, I do like stuff like that because the character Bodhi has a ton of personality, which I do appreciate. He does. And you know, like, there's a part of the second book that's really, really funny. Oh, really? That uh, about that? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll have to I'll, check I'll, it out. I'll, I'll, I'll spoil it a little bit. So they they go to this place where they have like unique rooms to themselves, like that get constructed from their minds. And he goes into his room, and there's a huge statue of him, and there's paintings of him on the wall. I just think that's super oh, wow. funny. <laughs> yeah, that <is laughs> like funny. that's what his mind thinks is the optimal room. I nice. just think that's really funny. So, so yeah, after. The, after Sorry, the merge, well, that's all right. After the merger happens, right? Bodhi, he wakes up, and he assumed that once this merger happened between left and right, because of how sentient these two constructs were, they would basically destroy the known time, and everything from that point on will be inside of a simulation, basically. So he wakes up and he realizes he is still on his ship and he sees his other crew members and things are around him and he starts talking to them and they also recollect what happened so he's like so time did not break right mm -hmm. but he then sees that there is somebody else there who refers to themselves as center which is left and right combined consciousness essentially yeah and they they center has taken over Nerika the lesser's barge and has essentially like created cocoons for all of Nerika the lesser's crew where he's showing them love he's right like he's them in these simulations and monitoring their like happiness is that right, right? that's what it sounded like to me yeah it's it's actually really cool what he does to Narakov the Lesser, in my opinion. So he like broke him down to like each of his individual like egg parts of of Narakov the Lesser, and they're like merged with the nano machines. So he's right. like experiencing. So each of those things is all experiencing different things. But because Center goes into explains that like why he thinks these people were so bad is because they never knew love. Yeah, like each individual Sadrona being, right? Mm -hmm. That's why when they are combined, they are kind of evil is because all of them know nothing but evil. Yeah. I, I mean, there is a lot like uh, talking about like, you know, like what is time about and what is like, what does it mean to do this? And I mean, oh, there's quite really... a bit of like, yeah, there's quite a bit of like quantum things that are way over my head. I mean, they're over Bodhi's head too, so which right. is which is cool. Which is funny, yeah, because it really leaves you as the listener out when your main character and who they're talking to know what they're talking about, but we, the listener, don't know. Mm -hmm. So I do appreciate that that there's a little sidebar at the end where Bodhi kind of like he's like, now if none of this makes any sense to you, none of it makes any sense to me either. Yeah, <laughs> which is pretty funny. But I mean, Center does go on to explain that, like, uh, he knows he knows that Bodhi was worried if they merged, they would just kill all consciousness. But Center sees no point in that. Like, even though he's all powerful, essentially a god. Well, doesn't he, he say in the like the seconds that transpired when basically when they merged, and the seconds that transpired while Bodhi and everybody else was unconscious, they experienced like thousands of years of 
consciousness basically like awakening Mm -hmm. of in thousands and thousands of years so they really do have like all of this knowledge available to them at any time and they know how to do pretty much anything asked of them and they said other beings similar to them go on to create their own universes and and run them basically but center doesn't see any point in doing that yeah and like center's plan is like to essentially like rip a wormhole and uh, isolate him and his children into their own reality and Bodhi's like how long do you think it'll take to make an engine like that he's like i don't know three seconds yeah i love that yeah i don't know maybe three seconds because <laughs> it sounds so complicated but center is like eh, it's pretty simple so yeah Bodhi gets back onto his ship and then narakod the lesser's barge just like winks out of existence it's just right like, like it was never there yeah also center transferred all of narakad the lesser's wealth oh, that's right. to bodhi's account so bodhi is now what does he say it's something like 435 billion i think it's 485 okay that is yeah. kind of important later oh okay interesting uh but he does not tell the crew about that immediately I, of course not <laughs> because yeah if they knew they were all super rich number one they probably all want their cut and number two they probably wouldn't work for him anymore knowing that they don't need to do these dangerous missions because they're already rich so you'll have to i I don't want to spoil too much so can you talk about the end because it's hard for me to remember where the line stops yeah basically what happens is him and chaska hook up and that's basically the end of the book is his he so chaska basically what what happens is they kind of go to bodhi's quarters talk about what happened between left and right and they also talk about how chaska still wants to be part of like this these rebels that are fighting the hegemony and she's like well that's really too bad you know that you're just a gun runner and you're not part of the uh i can't remember what they call themselves liberationists yeah uh, yeah and Bodhi calls them insurgents yeah that's right he calls them insurgents she calls them liberationists and Bodhi's immediately like well we are now just so happens (laughs) he he basically promises his ship to the liberationists cause against the hegemony um and then him and Chaska hook up which I think it's kind of funny how Bodhi like explains what happens between them without explaining any of it um and the the uh i can't remember who it is from the beginning contacts him again from the very beginning oh oh I, yeah, yeah i can't remember her name yeah it's like a senator or some like kind of government official yeah. contacts him again that yeah that and that's basically where the book ends is is with him getting that part i i, I so they 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 don't open the canister no not in the first book they don't it must be in the very beginning of the second book because they do not open it in the end of the first book okay i thought i thought there was a cliffhanger i don't think so i just finished it this morning i i mean my brain is mush so i could be misremembering but i don't think so because basically now bodhi is like sworn but i okay maybe you're right I don't think so. But that's that's good to know that there's there's more in the second story. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean that's pretty much it though. At the, that's the end of the first book is mm-hmm. he he promises his ship to the the liberationists against the hegemony. That's pretty much where that ends. Yeah. Yeah, the first book is pretty good. I thought so. I mean, I feel kind of bad now that you listened to all three and I only listened to one. Um, oh, I mean, it's all good. Like I said, I was in a bit of a weird place listening to this one. I was, I, And I'm not trying to take anything away from the book. I was just, for some reason, I would play it and I was, my mind was elsewhere to the point where I was like, I got to put on a podcast or something else that I don't need to pay attention to in order to understand. Right. You know what I mean? For For some reason. So... That's why I only managed to get through the first one. It's not because it wasn't a good book. That's I don't want okay, anyone to so, think that. 
just just to clear it up, there is something that happens. They do open the canister at the end of the first book. Oh, they do. So did? Oh, yeah. Okay. So after he talks to that lady, he comes into Gadra's room, and she has opened this artifact canister. Oh, okay. All right, go on. And yeah, and in her lap is. And they've kind of explained, too, that, like, whatever's in this canister, whoever oh, opens it is going to bond with this thing. That's right. And the bonding okay. cannot be undone. Now I remember. Yeah. You're right. So she opens the canister. W- without anybody knowing, she opens it, and there's, like, this little tusk creature in her lap. And right. that's where the book ends. Okay. Yes. Now I remember. Okay. I, I just – because that, that's a huge cliffhanger, and I feel yeah. like it's kind of important to mention. That's right. Yeah, and and he says something like that, right? He's like, "Well, nothing we can do about it now." So yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think I'm good. I don't think I have anything else to say. It's pretty good. I'd check it out if I was you. It just it probably just came out, so maybe scoop it up. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely thought it was a good book. Uh, pretty much all the better because. It was given to us, which is amazing. So yeah, I know I'm still riding that high. Yeah, yeah. What um? Do we know what we're doing next time? Uh, I mean, we haven't talked about it. Do you have something have lined up that you want to do? No, I don't at all. So if there's anything else, if there's anything you want to do, let me know right now if you can. <laughs> um, uh, maybe we'll talk about it off air. I put that yeah. in quotes. That's fine. We uh, in, we'll go back to the green room. And discuss yeah. it. <laughs> Whatever, douchebags. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah. Uh look forward to more anime squires. We should have some more of that coming out soon. We're trying to get finished up on Cowboy Bebop. We still got quite a ways to go on that. I realize there's like 26 episodes. Yeah, it's We're gonna be a long on... season. Yeah, we, we still got a ways to go on that. So if that's something you enjoy, let us know. We would uh, or if it's something you hate, let us know. We would yeah, you know, yeah. either either <laughs> Tell way. Us either way um yeah you got you got anything else for him no other than thanks for listening we truly appreciate every single one of you that listens to these i check it almost constantly and i get happy when it goes from 10 to 11 so i appreciate every single one of you guys especially if you're sticking around all the way to the end uh yeah i really appreciate you guys great and And, uh, yeah i think with that we'll, we'll leave it 